that just becomes such a nightmare. Or if you go back to a project that you worked on maybe a year ago, <laughs> you know, you ca it's crazy. Hey guys, Dilby here. I'm in my studio in Berlin and today I want to do a little walkthrough of my template. So this is what opens up every time when I open up Ableton. This is how it loads. For me this is a really important part of my workflow because it allows me to have a bunch of things that I would do on every project ready to go. This saves me so much time and allows me to actually just get on with the task of making music. So what I want to do is walk you through my template and explain some of the reasoning as to why I've done things and why things are set up a certain way. Hopefully you can take this and implement it into, into your workflow. Let me know in the comments if you want me to make this template available for download, that's no problem. But it's specifically designed based on the way that I work and the things that I do in every track. So the things that you do in every track might be totally different. But if you want it and you think it might be helpful, then let me know in the comments and I'll put a link in the description below so that you can download it. Working fast and allowing myself to bring my ideas to fruition as quickly as possible is a big part of what allows me to be prolific, meaning that I finish a lot of tracks. And I think this is um, really key in getting the best out of yourself as a producer. I would 100% recommend that everybody sets up a template for their DAW based on the way that they work. I think this is super important to just speed things up and get everything moving. Okay, so that said, let's just jump right into Ableton and I'll show you exactly what's going on in my template. So here we are inside a blank Ableton project. And this is exactly how the program opens every time I load a new, t a new project. What I've got here is an area for a space for a reference track. Um, I've got a drum bus, a, ba a bus for the kick and bass, and then I've got all of my drums here in different groups. So I've got kicks, claps and snares, hats and shakers, percussion. Then I've got a group for my bass, and a group for my melodic elements, a group for my vocals, a group for my effects, and then I've got another track here which I use to record things from inside the project to audio and I'll explain that a little bit later. Now you see that everything in the project is named and color coded. Now I find that super important for me to make sure that I can find things quickly and just stay organized. Um, I used to work just starting from a blank Ableton project and just loading tracks and as I, as I went. Um, every different color under the sun, unnamed, and when you start, when you get to the point where you've got a really big project, that just becomes such a nightmare. Or if you go back to a project that you worked on maybe a year ago, <laughs> you know, you it's crazy. So I learned that the hard way, and I've become more organized, and it's really, really helped out with the speed that I'm able to do things. So I can't stress that enough. Just get organized. It takes a little bit of time as you go and a little bit of discipline, but it's so worth it in the long run. So what I've done here is added in a quick arrangement, and that'll allow me to explain some of the specifics of the template in a bit more detail. So what, I'm, what I want to talk about is the signal flow of everything. Because I'm set up with all these groups and buses, things don't just go directly to the master. The group for kicks and the group for bass are routed into the bass bus. Within those groups, each channel is routed to the group. So you see here, this kick has the group kicks selected. The group kicks has the kick and bass bus selected. So that sends the signal from this kick channel to the group, to the kick and bass bus. And then that output is routed to the master. So the same thing applies for each of these groups of percussion. They all go to the drum bus. Um, the hats, this open hat for example, goes to the hats and shaker group. Into the group. To the bus. To the master. 
So for some people that might seem just totally obvious and not worth explaining, but there's probably some people watching who are new to this, so I just thought I'd touch on it quickly. So as you'll notice, I've got a bunch of groups in here. Um, what a group is, is a selection of audio or media, MIDI channels that is kind of put into a container track. I'll show you quickly how that works. Command T to make a new audio track. Command Shift T to make a new MIDI track. So let's just say I want these two to be in a group together. I then hit Command G. And that's grouped them. And that automatically sets up the routing that I was talking about before. All right, so let's just have a listen to what I've got going on here. And then I can show you a quick example of how of how and why you would use groups. Alright, so really basic little arrangement there, um, nice little groove. As you saw there was like a little mini break there um, and it dropped back in. To enhance that, what I could do is add a filter onto the Hat and Shakers group, filter them out a little bit and then throw them back in just to accentuate that, that little break and accentuate the drop. So I'll show you how that might work. So what I'll do is throw an auto filter onto the hats and shaker group. Okay. And now into this break I'll just add a little bit of automation. Bringing the frequency down. And now you can see what I mean. So just something super simple like that, so quick, just adds another little dimension to each, each section of your track. Um, and that's super easy. If I wasn't using groups, I would have had to apply that filter to each track individually. But this way I can just do it once and process all the hats together. Another reason why having these groups is super handy is in the mixing process. So I can get the balance of all my hats sounding right, and that's kind of an artistic choice. But in the final mix, the hats all take up a kind of similar frequency spectrum. So when it comes to the mix down, I might have too much high frequency in my track from all of the hats kind of adding up on top of each other. And what I can do is just change the volume of this group to adjust that, rather than kind of going through each individual track. Because I've decided that I like the balance of the hats, I like how they sound together, but maybe those high frequencies are just a bit too much, or maybe the hats sound a bit too dull. So I can just adjust all of them together. By having them in groups, it allows you to kind of simplify the whole process, and you've just got eight or 10 different groups of elements rather than maybe 50 or 60 tracks that you have to manage. Um, as long as you're happy with the balance of those, uh, of those single tracks within that group, then you're able to just manipulate the volume and apply processing, EQ, compression, etc. to that whole group. And I find by doing it this way, it makes it much easier to get a kind of nice balance on in the final mix down of my track. Now at the top of the project here, I've got these two buses, the kick and bass bus and the drum bus. I'll leave a link here to a track walkthrough that I did recently, which kind of goes into a lot more detail about how I actually process things in these buses. The concept is pretty similar to groups and it just allows me to combine similar elements together so that I can process them and get them sounding as like one cohesive unit, like all the drums sounding like a drum kit. <laughs> or to get the kick and bass sounding really nice together as one cohesive low frequency element. Okay, so the next thing in my template is a bunch of return tracks. Now these are all things that I use really frequently in 
pretty much every project. And it just allows me to do little bits of processing that I would put in every track um, really quickly and easily. For example, I've got a drum reverb here, and that just adds a little bit of the same reverb to all of the drums. I've then got a synth verb, which is kind of like a hall. Then I have a big long spray reverb, which I use to create um, tension and build up. Then I've got a series of delays. This is like a self-automating delay, which I use in every project, um, just for kind of washy fills and things. And having things like that in your template just really allows you to have your own signature sound and things that can reoccur in each track. Then I've got something here which I use to brighten up and widen my high frequency on my drums. The next is pretty much the same thing but for synths. And then finally I've got a parallel kick compressor to add some parallel compression Next I want to talk about gain staging a little bit. Everyone's pretty familiar with the concept that you don't want your master channel peeking into the red or you don't want an individual track peeking into the red as that's going to introduce digital distortion. Something that's often overlooked is that you don't want that kind of that same peaking in any part of your signal chain. So whether that's coming out of a synthesizer or coming out of a loop from a loop pack in loop packs they're all kind of normalized to be peaking at zero db and this can all can often cause real problems when you start to add effects and processing to them so next up let's have a look at my master channel now what i've got here is slate digital virtual summing um, processor this is like this is a really cool little processing thing it just adds a bit of warmth and saturation if you want to know more about it then check out Slate Digital, they've got loads of information about it on their website. The next thing I've got here is a Synalxis Free G. The reason it's turned up by 7 dB is that I want to have the output of my track when I'm working similar to what the final track is going to sound like. But when you get a track professionally mastered, they're going to want that file delivered at minus 6 dB. So this allows me to hear what I'm working on at full volume, then I turn it off and I've instantly got a track that's ready for mastering. Next up I've got a limiter and this is just to stop anything going into the red or peaking while I'm working on the track. I've got a spectrum analyzer so I can see what's going on with the frequencies in my track. I've got this cool little device called a Zillos Megascope and what that does is allows you to see an, an output of your track in a waveform. Anyone that uses DJ software will be very familiar with what this looks like. Uh, next up I've got a loudness meter. Then I've got another spectrum analyzer which I use to just check the stereo field. make sure that nothing's phasing. And lastly, I've got Sonarworks, which I just use for a little bit of room correction. It's turned off at the moment because I'm recording the output of Ableton. Um, something I mentioned before was the reference track that I have at the top of the project. Uh, this is just a remix that I recently did for Oliver Shorey's. Did pretty well on Beatport, shameless plug there, um, feel free to go grab yourself a copy. Now the purpose of the reference track is basically to keep me um, focused in the right direction while I'm working. It's, it's super helpful in the mixing process because you can put a track in there that you've played in the club and you know really works well on the dance floor, it sounds great. Um, you can put it in there and kind of A, B between your track and that track. Okay, one other thing that I mentioned that I haven't this resample track for recording little bits from inside my project down to audio. I've got here a high string that is coming from an external hardware device. The input of the track is set to resampling. What that means is that it's going to record the output of the master channel and hit record. So 
All right, now if I make a new audio channel, high string audio, and then I can just drag that up. loop it up and now I've got an audio version of this high string another thing which I have implemented in my template which I haven't heard a lot of people talk about is uh, having to default audio and MIDI tracks. I'll show you how that works here. If I create a new audio track, you'll see by default this has an EQ, a glue compressor and an IFO tool on it and the volume is set to minus 10. So these are all uh, plugins that I would put on most tracks uh, in my project and because of the gain staging we talked about before I want to have I want to make sure that the track volume is turned down. So the way you can do this for yourself is throw in whatever plugins you like, adjust the volume or any settings that you like, then you right click on the track title here and you hit save as default audio track. Exactly the same process for MIDI track. That's a super handy wee tip, just speeds things up, again keeps that workflow pushing along. Okay so the next thing I want to mention is the favorites browser. Um, I think this was implemented in Live 10 and it's so handy. So up at the top of Live's browser here you've got seven collections. You can rename these to whatever you want. You can put anything in here so you could put your favorite sample pack, you can put live devices, you can put um, third-party VSTs. I recommend setting this up however it works for you. I've obviously got it organized into some synths, EQs, chorus and widening, saturation and distortion, delays and reverb, compressors, and then favorite. All right, um, another important thing about making a template is how the hell do you make a template? So it's basically a more detailed version of making the default audio or media channel. What you do is you go to preferences, you click on the file folder tab, and then at the top, save current set as default. Next time you open a new live set, it's going to open exactly as you've got your project here. What I do is actually save a version of the project onto my hard drive. That way I can kind of go and adjust it, and when I'm happy with it, I can hit save as default. All right, so it looks like that's a wrap. Um, hopefully you enjoyed that. It's kind of a strangely simple yet complex thing to try and explain on video. So let me know in the comments if there's anything that I kind of breezed over or something you'd like more information about and I'll try and help you out. I 100% recommend that you get started making your own template and implement this for your productions. It's just going to speed up uh, your whole workflow and make your life so much easier. It's a major hack for my workflow and it just allows me to be much more productive. Let me know in the comments what you thought of this tutorial. Please let me know what subjects you'd like me to cover in the future. I think the next subject that I'll cover is like my top five tips to speed up and maximize your workflow. Make sure you follow me on Instagram at Dilby DJ. I keep that regularly updated and you can kind of see a bit more of an insight into my day-to-day -day life, what's going on, um, my releases that are coming up, uh, collaborations that I'm doing, my DJ schedule, what DJ schedule, we're in a global lockdown and I also post other like studio updates and tips and tricks on there as well. If you want to check out the music that I release there's a link to Beatport and Spotify in the description of this video so go check it out and thanks for watching. See you next time. Peace!